Welcome to 3ABN Sabbath School panel. This is what we've been enjoying from week to week with your participation. And if you follow this the whole quarter, you know that we've been walking through a book that is reminding us how deep the knowledge of God is and yet how much we can still learn in spite of our understanding and experience. Today we end on lesson 13, Ablaze with God's Glory. And we've been covering the three cosmic messages and I know that we have been blessed. Can the church say amen? Amen. Yes. <laughs> and, uh, but today we're gonna close out this lesson talking about Revelation 18. How is the message of God going to close? Not with less manifestation than it began. It's going to close with a blaze of glory and countless will be in that number of the redeemed. Before we go to that though, let's introduce our panel. To my left is Daniel Perrin in our pastoral department. Good to have you today, mm -hmm. Daniel. Thank you. And I have Monday's lesson, which is knowing truth. And I always appreciate your approach to it. Thank you for being here. Pastor James Rafferty. What do you have for us today? Good to be here, John. I have Tuesday's lesson, The Reformation Continues. Okay, and the singer in Israel, evangelist and preacher who loves to break out in song every now and then, Ryan Day. Amen. I have wisdom, Wednesday's lesson entitled, God's Glory Fills the Earth. You haven't sung yet for any of these programs on Revelation. What's, what's wrong with that? Uh, Spirit hasn't led me to do that yet, <laughs> brother. <laughs> And Shelly Quinn, good to have you here, Shelly. It is good to be here. I want to say what a privilege it is to be on this panel and to hear all of you and learn from you. I have Thursday's lesson, my favorite topic, the lamb, the slain lamb. Well, since you're the only lady on the set, would you begin with prayer for us? Absolutely. Our loving Heavenly Father, how we thank you for the gift of prophecy. Thank you for the prophecy that is in this book that prepares us, Lord, uh, to know what's coming, that we might be prepared for your coming. And Lord, we ask in the name of Jesus now, I know that you've anointed the study of this word, your word is anointed, but anoint the presentation now. And may you give us ears to hear what the Holy Spirit has to say and a heart that will follow you. We love you, Lord. We thank you so much for your plan of salvation. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you, Shelley. Thank you so much. Ablaze with God's glory. Let's look at Revelation 18, verse 1. The fall of Babylon. We've talked about the mark of the beast, a topic that was very sobering, realizing that the world is on a pinnacle of decisions for eternity or against it. And the choice is yours. But look at Revelation 18. By the way, this is the swelling of the second angel's message. When we talked about Babylon has fallen, has fallen, it didn't follow the cadence of a loud voice, a loud voice. The first message was a loud voice. The third was a loud voice, but the second grew to a loud voice. And we find it in Revelation 18, verse 1. After these things, I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority. And the earth was illuminated with his glory. And I'm going to add verse two just for the sake of it. And he cried mightily with a loud voice. I'll leave it there because mm -hmm. Pastor James Rafferty is going to talk about this in specifics. But, you know, we're preparing for something that the world to a large degree is unaware of, as it was in the days of Noah. They continue eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. And they did not know until the flood came and took them all away. So the person that wrote the song, the marketplace is empty, no more traffic in the streets, all the builders to are silent, no more time to harvest wheat. That's not the actual picture because as it was in Noah's day, commerce, people were marrying, giving in marriage, buying, selling, planting until the day Noah entered the ark. And they did not know until the flood came and took them all away. So we have a world that's ablaze in activity when the angels of God are rushing to and fro, finishing the task appointed to them to get the world ready for the coming of our, of our Redeemer. So friends, while Noah was building the ark, people were buying and selling until the day Noah entered that ark and did not know till the flood came. We're talking about this message because we don't want you to meet God unprepared. Mm -hmm. It doesn't make sense to meet God not being prepared for him when he has given you every opportunity to be ready. But the Bible says, for at such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man is coming not secretly, but in a blaze of glory. First Thessalonians talks about why we should not be caught off guard. Let's go to First Thessalonians chapter five and I'll read verses one to six. But concerning the times and seasons, brethren, 
I love what the Apostle Paul says, you have no need that I should write to you. Mm -hmm. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. But you, brethren, those of you that understand Revelation, those of you studying your Bible, those of you listening to the voice of God, but you, brethren, are not in darkness, so that this day should overtake you as a thief. You are all sons of light and sons of the day. We are not of the night, nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us be what? Be sober. Yes. Let us watch and be sober. The Lord is saying, watch. Watch the movements of the world. You know, I recently heard uh, Time Magazine, there's a committee that uh, talks about Time Magazine. They govern the Time Magazine committee. And in this recent expose, they said, we have now moved the end clock of the world to 60 seconds before midnight. Mm. And I thought, what? <laughs> They're looking at the movements of the world and they said, we have moved the clock from 60 seconds to 10 seconds before midnight. So even people that don't know Jesus know that we are on the verge of a stupendous mm. crisis. Everything in the world is in agitation, as Ellen White says. You could look at the movements between nations, the rise and fall of the economy, the instability of morality. We can look at the, de to the deplorable nature of society, the dumbing down, the, 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 the legalizing of marijuana to dumb down society. I know it has some medical purposes, but most people that take it are not in any medical scare or any medical condition. Uh, but we could see the intoxication of society by media, by, by drugs, by crime, by immorality. Something's happening that's bringing the world to a head and in the midst of all of that confusion, the Lord is saying, listen carefully what the Spirit is saying to you today. So I'm going to give you seven reasons as to why we should be sober and getting ready for the coming of the Lord. How do we prepare for the final crisis that is going to take the world by storm? Let me say, friends, the woman is pregnant. The day of her deliverance is just around the corner. What should we do first? Look, let's go to 1 John chapter 1 and verse 7. The first thing we should do to prepare for the final crisis is walk in the light. Yes. Walk in the light. The light is not intended to blind you, but to enlighten your mind. The commandments of God are the light. His word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our paths. You study God's word, you won't be in darkness. You will see what the news commentators are eventually going to say. God is far ahead of man. He declares the end from the beginning and from ancient times, things that are not yet done. So don't listen to CNN and ABC and NBC and all the other networks. Read God's word and when you hear them begin to say it, you'll say, ah. I already knew that. Mm. God's people are not in darkness. Mm. But the Bible says, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. When you walk in the light, there's a cleansing benefit that comes. There's a fellowship, a quantity that comes. We have fellowship. I don't walk in the light because Daniel's my friend. I walk in the light because Jesus is my friend and Daniel is my fellowship. Mm -hmm. You see, we are brought together by the light. We walk in it. We have cleansing and fellowship. Second thing, what should we do to prepare for the final crisis? We should worship God based on the revealed truth of his word. John 16, verse 13, notice how the spirit works. However, when he, the spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into all truth for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak and he will tell you things to come. It's not ironic that revelation or no coincidence that revelation seven times says, he who has ears to hear, and believe me, I know what that means. He who has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. Making no light of that, but hey, that's a family print. We've got ears. Jeremiah makes it clear we have to be determined to follow God's word based on the mouth of God, not on the mouth of humanity. Notice Jeremiah chapter 23 and verses 21. It says, I have not sent these prophets yet they ran. I have not spoken to them, yet they prophesied. There are many people today saying what God has not said, but they're prophesying. Mm -hmm. They're proclaiming what God has not ever revealed, but they're saying God has said, God has said, I am against those who do such thing. Base your cadence on the revealed written word of God, 
not some momentary inspiration. Hey, God just gave me a message. If it doesn't line up with God's word, it is not from God. Number three, do not accept the word of man over the word of God. The evidence that deception is rampant is when we do that. Notice the comparison. God says, remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. Man says, do not remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. Which one would you follow? That's how we are prevented from being deceived. Receive the word of God over the word of man, no matter how large their church is. Mm -hmm. Forget about their popularity. If it's not from God's word, you'll say thank you, but no thanks. God's word is supreme. Men say, when we die, we go straight to heaven. God says, when we die, we go to the grave until the resurrection morning. Follow God's word over man's word. Man says, hell fire is eternal. God says, hell's fire will burn out eventually. Follow God's word over man's word. God says, worship him in spirit and in truth. Men said to worship based on experience mm. and feeling. Yep. But God's word is supreme once again. Worship according to God dic God's dictates. Number four, settle for nothing but truth. Jesus says, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. Not just set you free, but keep you free. It's not a get out of jail card till you pass jail again. It's stay out of jail card. The truth keeps you out of jail. Amen. Amen. <laughs> it keeps you out of jail. You won't get locked up. And no matter, no matter what anybody says, they'll never put you back in jail. That's why Isaiah 26 verse 2 says, open the gates that the righteous nation which keeps the truth may enter in, yes. not just worships and feeling, but keeps the truth. Number five, don't settle for being called a Christian, be one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Isaiah four verse one, and in that day, seven women shall take hold of one man saying, we will eat our own bread and wear our own apparel. Only let us be called by your name to take, a, take away our reproach. Don't settle for the name, settle for nothing less than a relationship with Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Then his truth comes as a part of the package, not just a part of the name. Number six, love Jesus, not just with your mouth, but with your heart. Matthew 15, verse eight, these people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Why the heart? Because for those who say the commandments were done away under the old covenant, the new covenant says, this is the covenant, Shelley, I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts and in their minds, I will write them. God has not abrogated his law. He's just taken it off a stone and yes. put it on our hearts. And lastly, be obedient to God's commandments. John 14, 15, if you love me, come on, keep my, keep my commandments. commandments. And this is the precursor to entering the new Jerusalem. Revelation 22, verse 14, blessed are they who keep the commandments of God that they may have a right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. Preparation for going out with a blaze of glory is allowing the truth of God's word to ignite your life so that you are not consumed, but you are set on fire for God's glory. Daniel. Thank you, Pastor Lomakang. That leads right into what I'm sharing from Monday's lesson. I'm Daniel Perrin and I have uh, knowing truth. Mm. How do you decide what you believe is true? Because uh, whatever I believe, regardless of what merits it may have and how it makes me feel, I want it to be true. Well, Proverbs 120 tells us that wisdom calls aloud outside and she raises her voice in the open squares. That's the marketplace. Mm -hmm. That's the place where people do business. That's the place where you hear it. Well, there's a lot of competing ideas out in the marketplace raising their voice. Even in the Christian church, there is a marketplace of faith. You can believe whatever you want mm -hmm. to believe. Mm -hmm. But most people who ask this question, how do I believe or decide what's true? They really ask it in this way. How do I know God's will for my life? What does God want me to do? Because truth always gets translated into action, into a life that lives out what you believe. Well, there's only two ways to decide what is true. And it's not through constructing it, making it yourself, because I have limited experience and ability. I don't have all the evidence. Uh, truth is not elected. It doesn't come by popularity or fitting in because uh, the people are not always right. It's not established by tradition. Jeremiah 16, verse 19, the Gentiles say, our ancestors inherited lies. It's not established by pragmatics, which says, well, it, it gave me what I wanted. It, it did what I felt like at the time or feelings. My emotions can be wrong. They can deceive me. And a truth is not established by human authority that says, well, he ought to know he has a degree. Truth is only, uh, only established when it is the, when it is left standing, when all the evidence is in. 
Uh, how much evidence do I have? And uh, in my vast knowledge of the universe, not much. So I have to take truth on authority. It always comes on authority. So we have to decide carefully, who's my authority? Take origins, for example, we've dealt with that this quarter, uh, this lesson study where uh, nobody was there at creation. So you have to choose your authority here. Well, uh, for the Christian, the final criterion is always the word of God. That is our authority. John 17, verse 17, we've, we've uh, shared this text so many times, sanctify them by your truth uh, and your word is truth. And then John 16, 13, that Pastor Lomakin just shared where it says, however, when he, the spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into all truth. He's not gonna force you into truth. He's gonna guide you into truth for he will not speak of his own authority, but what he hears, he will speak. In other words, there's no divided message coming from heaven. It's a completely unified message and it will not contradict itself. So there are some implications for truth for the Christian and the Christian mind. And number one is that you will not have all truth, but ultimately all that you have should be truth. Amen. It would be presumptuous to say, well, I know it all, but I want every bit of what I believe to be truth. Mm -hmm. Jeremiah 17 verse nine says that the heart is de deceitful and, and, and wicked above all things, desperately wicked. In other words, it wants to cling to error, cling to lies. And so I have to say, search me, O Lord, and see if there's any unrighteous way in me. Lord, help nothing, help me not to desire to hold on to anything that doesn't exalt you as true. That's right. uh, truth always will exalt our heavenly father and his love and his character. And it will always exalt Jesus. That prayer Jesus prayed there the night before he died. Uh, this is eternal life, to know you, the only true God and Jesus, all right? To know God, to know Jesus is truth. Okay. Truth always will be unified because it comes from one source. And so it will always be in harmony. And this is why it's a joy to search every book of the Bible. Mm -hmm. Habakkuk, Leviticus, what's your favorite book of the Bible? Whatever I'm reading right now, Revelation, Philemon, whichever book it is, is teaching us the truth about Jesus. And so whatever is in contradiction to that, it's in error. And if there are apparent contradictions, it just says that I don't yet understand. And it's okay to have questions about the Bible and the Word of God. We don't know it all. I don't know it all, but I'm always growing. And then we need to be able to identify error because the dragon who is angry with the woman attacks through error, through deception. Mm -hmm. And so we can say, well, I don't, I don't want to be in a fight. You can't help it. You're always in a fight right mm -hmm. here. Second Corinthians 10 verse four and five says, our weapons of warfare, warfare are not carnal weapons, but they're mighty. They're for pulling down strongholds, mm -hmm. casting down arguments. This is an offensive strategy. A defensive strategy just at best results in a stalemate. We say, we're gonna tear down these strongholds. And then the end of that text says, bring every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Mm -hmm. And which means that you, you're not necessarily casting down truth, uh, casting down error, in other people's lives, but search me, O oh Lord, and take right. down every stronghold of error or deception that I'm holding on to. You can be confident in the truth because truth is eternal. It starts with God. It resides in God. God doesn't change. And so you can trust that it's the same for all times, people, and places. When the three angels come, they're bearing the everlasting gospel, That's not right. the changing gospel. It's unchanged, undiminished. And then you don't need to be embarrassed by the truth. Even if there's somebody who comes along and they speak smooth words and they have good style and they share something else in a way that's, that's uh, engaging, you, the truth is still the truth, even if you can't answer every question about it, right? You don't have to apologize or be embarrassed about saying and, and believing and standing on what you believe. Listen to Jesus here in Matthew 10, verse 33. Whoever denies me before men, him also I will deny before my father who is in heaven. Hmm. You don't have to be embarrassed to be a Seventh-day Adventist. That name is a powerful name, all right? Now the name of Jesus is a powerful name that saves, but think of this seventh day, takes us to the God of creation and his Sabbath, the God who gives the law and the God who gives the law also gives us provision and promise to obey the law. Uh, it, sin reminds us of our helplessness, which takes us to the savior who came in that first advent, the incarnation coming down from heaven with great love and his plan of salvation and the, the plan of restoration of our character to be just like his. Yeah. Sin removed, the blessed hope, the everlasting gospel is all in that name. 
you don't need any embarrassment for the spirit of prophecy and the writings of Ellen White. Right. You can hold them up and say, they shine a light on the word of God to help us understand it. That book, that precious book, Steps to Christ. It's not mm -hmm. steps to denominationalism, mm -hmm. steps to Christ and the great controversy. You can share that, you can read it and say, this prepares us for what we see coming. No embarrassment for the sanctuary message. I want to share with you one line from Great Controversy, page 423. Mm -hmm. The subject of the sanctuary was the key which unlocked the mystery of the disappointment of 1844. The sanctuary opened to view a complete system of truth, mm -hmm. connected and harmonious. Nothing in God's word is isolated and disconnected. It all works together. Hearing the truth is not knowing the truth. Always. Romans 16, verse 25. Listen to Paul, the last section of his, uh, his book there. Now to him who is able to establish you according to my gospel. What, Paul? It's your gospel? It's not mine? He had taken this in. It wasn't just something that he read and understood. It was a part of him. My gospel, and it should be yours too. And then truth must be followed. Deuteronomy 29, verse 29 says, The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong to us and to our children forever, mm -hmm. so that we may do all the words of this law. There's things we won't understand and we don't need to speculate on certain things that are coming, but we can say, all of this prepares me to be the person who says, Lord, I want to follow you, follow your truth. Let it change my life, not just a hearer of the word, mm -hmm. but a doer of the word. And then truth must be shared. Like these three angels, the fourth angel, making it even louder with a loud voice. Mark 5, verse 19, here's Jesus' words, go home to your friends and tell them the great things that the Lord has done for you and know he has had compassion on you. Mm -hmm. Psalm 37, verse 30, the mouth of the righteous speaks wisdom. Treasures hoarded will be treasures that waste away. Mm -hmm. And the same is true of truth. I had a phone call just last week from somebody here, uh, here in the 3 ABN pastoral department. And, and he said this, he said, I get my truth from what I read and you guys on 3 ABN confirm it for me. Oh, he was so excited as he began to rattle off. He was ablaze with the glory of God because it had come from God's word. And as we shared it, we weren't sharing the opinions of men. We were sharing what is, what is revealed, what comes out of God's word. Okay. And so all I could say to him on the phone was, yes, yes, as he said, and this, and this, mm -hmm. and this is a praise of God's word. Uh, not of 3ABN, but this ministry here and other ministries and other preachers and other sharers, housewives, children, people of, of all places who lift up God's word. The power does not come from them. It does not come from us. It comes from God's word. Mm -hmm. Let me leave you with Isaiah 54, 13. All your children shall be taught by the Lord mm -hmm. and great shall be the peace of your children. And we can rest on that. We can rest knowing that what we believe is true. And as we go into a final conflict, we can do it confidently knowing that God who holds truth mm -hmm. also holds us. Amen. Amen. Thank yeah. you, Daniel. Yeah. Wow. As you, as you can see, we lit the candle. It's ablaze with God's glory. And we are going to continue letting that candle shine. But don't go away. There are three more candles that are lit that must continue to shine. We'll be right back. Ever wish you could watch a 3 ABN Sabbath School panel again? Or share it on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter? Well, you can by visiting 3ABNSabbathSchoolPanel.com. A clean design makes it easy to find the program you're looking for. There are also links to the Adult Bible Study Guide so you can follow along. Sharing is easy. Just click share and choose your favorite social media. Share a link. Save a life for eternity. Well, friends, we continue in our study of Ablaze with God's Glory, and uh, James Rafferty is going to pick it up on Revelation 18. Yes, I have Tuesday's lesson, The Reformation Continues, and the quarterly goes on to say that God has raised up a last day people to stand on the shoulders of the great reformers of the past with the Bible as their only creed, Christ alone as their only source of salvation and the Holy Spirit as the only source of strength and the return of our Lord as the consummation of all their hopes. Amen. Truth, 
long obscured by darkness of error and tradition, including the Bible Sabbath, will be proclaimed to the world just before the return of our Lord. Mm -hmm. The quarterly goes on to say, the three angels' messages give birth to this last day movement to complete the Reformation and to participate with Christ in the finishing up of His work on earth. The great prophecies of the Bible's last book reveal a divine movement of destiny arising out of a disappointment to proclaim God's final message to the world. Revelation 14 describes a worldwide church spanning the globe with the good news of the eternal gospel. The three angels of Revelation 14 are joined by a fourth angel. In Revelation 18, this angel gives power to the proclamation of the three angels so that the earth is lightened with God's glory. So we're going to read Revelation chapter 18. Let's just look here in Revelation chapter 18 verses 1 and 2. And after these things I saw another angel come down from heaven having great power and the earth was lightened with his glory and he cried mightily with a strong voice saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen and has become the habitation of devils the hold of every unclean, of, of every foul spirit, and the cage of every unclean and hateful bird. This is a double fall. This is a spiritual fall, and it's a physical fall. Revelation chapter 18 is actually describing the physical fall, fall because Revelation 14 described a spiritual fall that wasn't quite complete until we get to Revelation 18. What happens in the meantime is the mark of the beast is enforced. Economic control is pushed upon everyone, and that economic control now comes down in Revelation chapter 18. All the deceptions are, are removed and the whole world stands back in aghast at the final fall of this colossal system of spiritual uh, and civil power united together to enforce a mark upon everyone, small, great, rich, poor, free, and bond. And the reason why this happens, the reason why Babylon falls is because the glory of God lightens the earth. Yes. You know, we can spend all day talking about Babylon. We can spend all day talking, well, Babylon is this, and Babylon is this, and Babylon, and there's gonna be an infinity beyond that. We could spend the rest of our Christian experience trying to identify what Babylon is, and we still won't get to the bottom of it because Satan is the mastermind behind it. He's the mastermind behind confusion. So what God does, is He says, listen, don't spend all of that time focusing on Babylon. What I want you to do is I want you to focus on the gospel, the everlasting gospel, the everlasting covenant, Jesus Christ. I want you to lift Jesus up. And when you focus on when the, when the earth is lightened with the glory of God, then Babylon is going to come down. That's going to be the consequence because you're going to be able to see clearly when you get your focus on Christ, who is the word. Thank you so much, Daniel, for what you shared and John for what you shared. We're just going to pick up and go a little bit further with that, just focusing on one aspect of it. When Jesus is lifted up, who is the Word, then everything else gets clear. Everything else gets clarity. In fact, we're told that the glory of God is the revelation of the character of God. And that's what's going to bring Babylon down, this revelation of, of His character. This is going to be the last message that's going to go to the world. It's going to be a revelation of the character of God. And we're going to be part of that. Why? How? How does that work? That's what I'd like us to focus on. You know, in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 17, it says that we all become changed into His glory mm -hmm. by beholding Him. That's right. Mm -hmm. In the Great Controversy, page 555, that's not a hard reference to remember, 555, mm -hmm. it says that this is a law, this beholding and becoming changed is a law both of our intellectual and our spiritual nature. Mm -hmm. That by beholding we become changed. And we know it's a law because it works yeah. for the negative too. The mm -hmm. things that you spend time watching, the things that you spend time beholding, the things that you spend time reading are the things that you think about. Mm -hmm. When you watch something, it's not just that moment of time that you, if it's a bad thing, you're wasting. Not just that moment of time that you're wasting. It's more than that because you think about it later on. Mm -hmm. It comes back to you. There are things that I listened to and watched years ago and I, every once in a while it comes back into the memory. You know That's what I'm right. saying? Oh, yeah. Well, God is going to take this law and work it for good. Whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think about these things. And really, if you think about it, if you carefully study Revelation and Daniel, these two prophetic twins, you're going to find that this is the actual message God gives to us. For example, right after the mark of the beast is, is expounded, it, it, it's revealed to us in Revelation 13, God gives instruction to His people. And here's the instruction, Revelation 14, verse 4. Here are they who follow the Lamb wheresoever He goes. Mm -hmm. Now, again, we want to clarify, John 1, verse 1, the Lamb 
Jesus Christ is the Word made flesh. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. To follow the Lamb wherever He goes is to follow the Word of God wherever it leads you. That's right. That's right. Oh, oh, you come in contact with the Sabbath. How am I going to keep the Sabbath? How am I going to get that day off work? Don't worry about that. That's right. You follow the Sabbath. You follow the Lamb. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. You follow the Lamb. He'll take care of that. He'll take care of you. Your bread and water will be sure. So the instruction God gives us in Revelation 14 is also the same instruction He gives us back in the book of Daniel. In Daniel chapter 12, we're told about a people who are going to find their names written in the book. And I'm not going to steal any from, anything from Shelley right now. She's going to be talking a little bit more about the Lamb's book of life, the Lamb's name from the foundation of the world, I should say. But in Revelation chapter, Daniel chapter 12, verse 1, And at that time Michael shall stand up in that great prince that stands for the children of thy people, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, uh, even up until that time, and thy people shall be delivered, everyone that's found written in the book. Right. Mm -hmm. This book... And being written in this book is, is significant in Daniel chapter 12, just like following the Lamb is significant in Revelation chapter 14, verse 4. Well, how do we find our names written in this book? Well, slip over to Malachi chapter 3. Malachi is an easy book to find. If you can find the Gospel of Matthew, instead of turning right to Luke, you turn left to Malachi. Malachi is the last book of the Old Testament. It's right next to the book of Matthew. V chapter 3, beginning with verse 15. See if this doesn't describe our present world right now. And now we call the wicked... Excuse me. Now we call the proud happy. Yea, they that work wickedness are set up. They that tempt God are even delivered. You know, there's laws being passed all over the place. I live in California right now. You know, you can go into a store and you can rob up to a thousand dollars, and they're not going to do anything. They're not going to touch you. Mm -hmm. You're set up. Yeah. And don't don't you doubt for a minute that criminals don't know that. There's all kinds of lawlessness taking place. There's all kinds of wickedness taking place. They're set up to do wickedness in a lot of these states. The laws are changing to the detriment of society. What are we supposed to do in this time? Where are we supposed to be at? What is God's instruction to us during this time of lawlessness? The, the lawlessness that, that takes God's seven-day Sabbath and, and transfers it to another day. The lawlessness that, that allows people to steal what you've earned, what you've uh, worked for. What do we do? Well, here's what verse 16 says. Then they that feared the Lord, fear God and give glory to Him, spake often. They did what? They spake often one to not once a week, not casually every once, often one to another. And the Lord hearkened and heard it. And a book of remembrance was written before him for them that feared the Lord and thought upon his name. This is the same truth that we find in Revelation 14. Thinking upon the name of Jesus, talking about Jesus Christ often, right? Mm -hmm. Don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is. And so much the more you see, as you see the day approaching, because we need that fellowship. We need mm -hmm. to think upon, focus on, in fact, Jesus was talking to, to Martha. Now, Martha was overwhelmed with the things of this world. She was, you know, trying to earn that money, put in her years so she'd get a good Social Security uh, amount so she could retire well. You know, she was just doing what she needed to do. And Mary, she was sitting at the feet of Jesus, just sitting at the, at the feet of Jesus, sitting before the feet of the Word, you know, just, just soaking in the Word of God. And Martha, she, this didn't, she was troubled about this. She was, she was upset about this. Jesus, you need to tell my sister to come and help me. That's what she says. And Jesus answers in verse 41 of Luke 10, and Jesus says unto Martha, 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 you are careful. You're troubled about many things. Verse 42, Luke 10, but one thing is needful. What? Jesus is bringing it down to this one thing that is needful. One thing is needle, needful. And Mary has chosen that one thing. And what has she chosen to do? Sit at my feet and learn. She's chosen to follow me wherever I go. She's learned, to, she's learned to, to meditate upon me, to talk about me, to think about me often. She's chosen that one thing. And guess what, Martha? It's not going to be taken away from her. And friends, that's what Jesus is saying to us today. That's what he's saying to you. Look unto me and be saved all the ends of the earth. Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. Behold the line of the tribe of Judah. Wipe those tears. It will not be taken away from you. You will be sealed. You will be settled into. You will be marked by God for the new Jerusalem when you keep your eyes on Jesus. Amen. Amen. Powerful. Thank you, my brother. My name is Ryan Day. I have Wednesday's lesson. It is entitled, God's Glory Fills the Earth. 
And uh, you know, I just want to jump right into the book of Revelation. I want to read a few texts. So we're going to kind of skip around just for the first opening minute here. But Revelation chapter 4, verse 11, I want you to, as I go through these texts, notice the common words. And the lesson brings this out. Notice the common words that you find between these verses. Revelation chapter 4, verse 11 is where we're going to start. Uh, Revelation chapter 4, 4, verse 11. Sorry. It says, You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. All right, now we skip over to Revelation chapter 5, and we read verse 12. Notice what it says. Sing with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. Now Revelation chapter 19 and verse 1. Revelation 19 and verse 1, And after these things I heard a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven saying, Alleluia, salvation and glory and honor and power belong to the Lord our God. And then, of course, Revelation chapter 21 and verse 26. Revelation 21 and verse 26. And they shall bring the glory and the honor of the nations into it. Speaking of the righteous inheriting the kingdom. It's powerful, my friends, when you consider back through these just few verses here that uh, tied to this, this concept of God's glory. He is worthy to receive honor. He's worthy to receive honor. He's worthy to receive honor. We see this over and over. He's worthy to receive honor and glory. And that's what we're called to do there in the first angel's message is to fear God and give glory to him. But yet we're also talking about in this lesson how God's very glory is going to fill the entire earth. And I'm just going to ask the question here. First of all, what is that glory? And how is God's glory going to fill the whole earth? Let's do some little bit of an identification here for just a moment. Uh, let's go to Exodus chapter 33. And uh, I think probably one of the clearest examples and, and definitions, I guess you could say, as for what God's glory really is, is found here in Exodus chapter 33. Of course, this is the instance in which Moses asked God, Lord, show, show yourself to me. Let me see. Let me see. I want to look upon you. And then God says, okay, notice in Exodus chapter 33, verses 18 and 19, he actually asked him, show me your glory. And in and, and Exodus 33, verses 18 and 19, he, and God says to him, or Moses says to him in verse 18, please show me your glory. And then God responds in verse 19 and he says, I will make my goodness pass before you and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before you. I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. I love this because God's response to his question, Lord, show me your glory. Well, you know, you and I would be thinking in terms of the, you know, the visual. We'd be looking at, you know, oh, this bright glory, just, ah, oh, just basking in the glory, right? Uh, but God says, yeah, I'll show you my glory, I will let my, what does he say? Goodness. My goodness pass before you. I will proclaim the name mm -hmm. of the Lord. I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious mm -hmm. and have compassion on whom I will have compassion. Right. My friends, what is God describing here? Mm -hmm. He's describing his character. Mm -hmm. God's glory it's his character. That's right. And it says in this lesson and in the Bible that in the last days, God's glory will fill the whole earth. And the question is, how is God's glory going to fill the whole earth if it's his character? Mm -hmm. And of course, the answer is simple, through his people. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just want to make this very clear. Uh, reading, in, uh, uh, this is Testimonies to the Church, Volume 6, page 19. This comes from, again, Testimonies for the Church, Volume 6, page 19. Notice what this says. It says, there is no glory for ourselves in our good works or our righteousness or our goodness. The message of Christ's righteousness is to stand from one end of the earth to the other. Right. This is the glory of God which closes the work of the third angel. So let me be clear. While God's glory will be filling the whole earth in the last days and it will be through us, it's not of our glory. It's not our glory. It's not our righteousness. It's not our goodness. It's not our compassion. It's not our mercy. No, 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 no. All of that is manifested in us from God. We're reflecting His righteousness and His glory. Also, God, uh, Testimony to Ministers and Gospel Workers, page 456. I really enjoyed this one as well. It says, what is justification by faith? It is the work of God in laying the glory of man in the dust That's right. and doing for man that which is not in his power 
to do for himself. I love that. Letting God be God in us, letting him do the work in us. There is no glory for ourselves, but yes, glory to God instead. And of course, my mind went to John chapter three, verse 30, as I was studying this lesson, because all I could hear echoing in my mind is he must increase and I must decrease. He must increase and I must decrease. Those are the words of John the Baptist. And my friends, that really is ultimately the gospel experience as we are being transformed uh, day by day from glory to glory, from faith to faith, as Paul writes, it is us decreasing and him increasing in our life. Now I want to take this a little bit, a little step into a different direction here, still under the same banner of God's glory filling the earth. You know, it's got to happen in us. It's, it must be manifest within us and, and his character, as we are told, must be reproduced in us perfectly before Jesus can return. I want to read a quote from you from Desire of Ages, page 309. It's a lengthy quote, but I just want to make this point because it's a powerful point to make. This quote says in Desire of Ages, page 309, it says, The greatest deception of the human mind in Christ's day was that the mere assent to the truth constitutes righteousness. Mm -hmm. In all human experience, a theoretical knowledge of the truth has been proved to be insufficient for the saving of the soul. Yes. It does not bring forth the fruits of of righteousness. A jealous regard for what is termed theological truth often accompanies a hatred of genuine truth as made manifest in the life. Hmm. The, dark, the darkest chapters of earth's history or of history are burdened with the record of crimes committed by bigoted religionists. Yes. The Pharisees claimed to be the children of Abraham and boasted of their possession of the oracles of God. Yet these advantages did not preserve them from selfishness, malignity, greed for gain and the basis hypocrisy. They thought themselves the greatest religionists of the world, but their so-called orthodoxy led them to crucify the Lord of glory. But then she goes on to say this powerful point. The same danger still exists right here today. Many take it for granted that they are Christians simply because they subscribe to a certain theological tenets, maybe 28. I don't know. But they have not brought the truth into practical life. They have not believed and loved it. Therefore, they have not received the power and grace that come through sanctification of the truth. Men may profess faith in the truth, but if it does not make them, and please don't miss this point, if it does not make them sincere, kind, patient, forbearing and heavenly minded. Pastor, you covered that last, last week. Heavenly minded. It is a curse to its possessors and through their influence, it is a curse to the world. Mm -hmm. My friends, this is, this is getting down to the nitty gritty. <laughs> I mean, we're talking about God's glory filling the earth. God's glory is his character. How is it going to fill the earth? It's his work in us, transforming us. We decrease, us decreasing, him increasing. But my friends, in order for that work to ultimately happen, it's not just subscribing to a few theological truths. You can profess and claim a certain truth all day long. And many people, I only bring this up because I'm meeting more and more Christians today because I, I see people who think that just because they believe in something that somehow that accounts for their righteousness. Well, you know, I believe in keeping the Sabbath and I'm a fourth or fifth generation, whatever, Baptist, Seventh-day Adventist, Pentecostal, whatever. And, and, I, and I, uh, I believe these truths and I uphold them and I proclaim them and I teach them. But yet these same people do it with such uh, a hatred and such a harsh attitude and such a, a uh, there's no compassion. There's no, there's no love. There's no, uh, you know, kindness there. And at the end of the day, Philippians chapter two, verse five, as we have learned, what does it say? Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. The transformation of character is simply a spiritual lobotomy. Taking the brain and you, you, you're getting rid of yours and you're allowing Christ to be reproduced in you. Right. Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23. But the fruits of the Spirit is... Love. Uh, wait, let me, let me rephrase that because that's not what it says. I, I, made a, I made a little bit of a mouth typo there. Okay. But the fruit mm -hmm. of the Spirit is love. And I suspect there should be probably a colon right here. Because everything that comes past this, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness... Self-control against such there is no law. All of those is a, is a description of the love of God, the character of God. That's why when we read 1 Corinthians 13, and it says, in, starting in verse 4, love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. It is not puffed up. See, this is the real test right here. 
It does not behave rudely. It does not seek its own. It does not, it's not provoked. It thinks no evil. It does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. What does the Bible say? God is love. love. But then I love verse 13 that caps off this chapter. It says, now abide faith, hope, and love. These three, but the greatest of these is love. We can claim to know a truth. We can claim to have a truth and be about the truth. But if that truth does not transform us into the very loving, compassionate character of God, then my friends, it does no good. Let God's glory be manifest in you so that you can shine forth his goodness before he comes. Amen, amen. My mind is going everywhere right now. Thank you all, each one of you so much. This has been such a beautiful, beautiful study. And I hope those of you at home have, if, if you were unfamiliar with Revelation, that you now realize Revelation is not a sealed book. The very title, Apocalypsis, means the revealing, as Revelation 1, 1 says, it is the revelation of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. You know, I was brought up in a church that taught you should read Revelation. Mm -hmm. And I used to peek over there and I'd read Revelation 1, 3. It says, blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it for the time is near. And I used to think, what? That's the only <laughs> book I know that has a blessing specific, specifically attached to it. But Revelation is a book of signs and symbols. And sometimes people get very confused by that. The meaning, oh, what helped me so much was to understand Daniel is a companion book mm -hmm. to Revelation. The meaning of the signs and symbols in Revelation, John wrote in these signs and symbols because Roman persecution, and he wrote it in such a way that these people who knew the Word of God from the Old Testament, you'll find all of these signs and symbols are explained somewhere in the Bible. We see in Revelation 12, the dragon in heaven. Revelation 14, the three angels flying in the midst of heaven. Revelation 17, the woman dressed in purple and, and riding on the scarlet beast. Bible prophecy is not meant to scare us. It is meant to increase our faith to prepare us for the coming of Jesus. The most important symbol in Revelation, now I've got to hold it back. The most important symbol in Revelation is the lamb. Mm -hmm. 26 times lamb is used as the title of Jesus in anticipation of the incarnation and the crucifixion the second person of the Godhead has been referred to as the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Now, th the word lamb is also used in Revelation 13, 11, when it is describing a, a lamb-like beast that has horns like a lamb and looks like a lamb. But Revelation 5 has God on the throne in heaven. He's holding the scroll with the seven seals. Revelation 6 explains uh, six of them. And then Revelation explains the opening of the seventh seal. Whatever's in the content of that scroll, we know it concerns our salvation mm -hmm. because only the lamb who died for us is worthy of opening that. I want to just give you a few references, and then we're going to wind this up, of the Lamb of God in Revelation. These are just a few of my favorite. Revelation 5 and verse 6 says, I looked and behold, in the midst 
of the throne and the four living creatures. In the midst of the elders stood a lamb as though it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes. The horns are his power. It's a perfection of power. The eyes are his wisdom, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And they sang a new song. They're singing to the lamb. And they said, you are worthy to take the scroll, to open its seals. You were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood. Out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation, you've made us kings and priests to our God. We shall reign on the earth. And they're saying in verse 12 with a loud voice, loud voice, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. I used to look years ago, I would look and I would see that, that they're always bowing down, holy, holy, holy. And I think, well, why is this? You know what? Now that I understand the everlasting gospel every day, I can't help but cry out, holy, holy, holy. I can't help but worship the Lord. I can't help but thank Him for what He has done. Revelation 7, 17, it says, the Lamb who's in the midst of the throne will shepherd them and lead them to living fountains of waters. They will, God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Revelation 12, 11 tells you, tells me how to overcome Satan, how to overcome the beast powers. It's by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony right. and not loving our lives to the death. We've got to be willing to say whatever, Lord, I will never, ever deny you. Revelation 15, 11 it says, sing the song of the Lamb, saying, great and marvelous are your works. O oh, Lord God Almighty, just and true are your ways. Revelation 19, 7 talks about the marriage of the Lamb that has come and his bride has made herself ready. In Revelation 21, 22 through 23, it's talking about the new Jerusalem and there is no need of a temple in the new Jerusalem because there's no sin in it. So they don't need a temple. Revelation 21, 22 says, I saw no temple for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city had no need of the sun or the moon to shine in it for the glory, the character of God illuminated it and the Lamb is its light. Amen. Revelation 22 and verses 1 and 3 says, He showed me a pure river of water, of life clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb, mm -hmm. the throne of the Lamb. There shall be no more curse, verse 3 says, for the throne of God and the Lamb shall be in it. Let me tell you something. We've been studying the three angels' messages. Revelation 14, 6 says, I saw, and this is the first angel, flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to all who dwell on the earth. Mm -hmm. The three angels' messages are founded on the everlasting gospel. And you say, what is the everlasting gospel? Well, we find it in Revelation 13, 8. Paul has, all, I mean, John has already written it. It's talking about the lamb who was slain from the foundation of the earth. That's right. This is mm -hmm. talking about the covenant that God, the Godhead got together before they created us and decided that one of them would come to earth, become like us, and pay our penalty for our sin. It's talking about the perfect life of Christ, the crucifixion of Christ, the resurrection of Christ, mm -hmm. the, the central message of the entire Bible from Genesis to Revelation, the foundation of the everlasting gospel is God's covenant of righteousness by faith. That is the everlasting covenant. 
Hebrews 13, 20 talks about Jesus' blood mm -hmm. being the blood of the everlasting yes. covenant. And I'll tell you what, when you look at this, what's the goal? What's the goal of the everlasting covenant? 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 21 says, He made him who knew no sin to be sin for us. Christ took on and bore our sin. It crushed his holy heart and God poured out his wrath against sin on Christ at the cross. But it says it was for this reason that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Oh, mm -hmm. hallelujah, hallelujah. The revelation of God's love to think that our Creator would take on our flesh, mm -hmm. would humiliate Himself yeah. to that point and take our flesh back to heaven that He, after He died for us, that He could be our high priest. Let me tell you, Christ is the center and the circumference of the entire message of the Bible. We cannot give the three angels' message to people who don't know what He has done to save us. It's all about Jesus. Thank you so much, Shelley, Ryan, James, and uh, Daniel. Give me some of your closing thoughts as we close this out in a blaze of glory. Well, the light of God's character uh, is, the light of God's glory is his character. And we get to see that in his law, which is why I love that longest chapter of the Bible, Psalm 119. Take you verse 98. You, through your commandments, make me wiser than my enemies. We have an enemy and God's character, his law, will help us to beat that enemy. Amen. You know, Babylon has silenced the voice of God and it must be proclaimed loudly and clearly. Babylon has confused the character of God and the, the world must be enlightened. Babylon has obscured the glory of God. It must be revealed. Another angel comes down from heaven and cries mightily with a strong voice and Babylon falls. Amen. Jesus says, and I, if I be lifted up, will draw all people to myself. My friends, just simply lift up Jesus today. Mm -hmm. Look to him, the author and finisher of your faith, and you can be restored. The everlasting covenant in the Old Testament, they knew there was a Messiah coming. They were saved looking forward to the cross. We are saved looking back to the cross, but righteousness by faith is going to change us to become like him. Wow, well, thank you all, everybody, for the whole quarter study and including Jill, who's not here with us today, but thank you for taking the time to tune in. What is Revelation's message? It's time to stand up for truth instead of falling for tradition. Time to straighten up so we can walk right. Time to speak up for the cause of Christ so that when the message closes, it closes with the blaze of glory in our lives. Next quarter, we start the book of Ephesians. Friends, we look forward. Thank you for joining us. We look forward to seeing you next quarter and next time. God bless you.